Cuban flag is raised as Cuba's embassy in Washington opens. It's the dawning of a new era in U.S.-Cuba relations. Of a progress towards a civilized relationship. Cuba's foreign minister makes nice and makes demands. The path to normal will not be easy. Miami Beckham United yeah. puts the site for a stadium it once called spiritually tainted. Then the Miami Commission says go for it. Just one of the topics we will take to the round table. Good morning and welcome. Great to be with you as always. The history made this week impacts so many in South Florida, whether personally, professionally, or economically, in so many ways. The opening of the Cuban embassy in Washington and very soon, about two weeks, the opening of the U.S. embassy in Havana marks the official, uh, the official start of diplomatic relations. We were there for, or Glenna was there, I should say, for the raising of the flag over what had been the Cuban interest section for the past 38 years. It has been 54 years since the U.S. severed relations with the Castro government because of Castro's leftward tilt and the confiscation of hundreds of millions of dollars worth of U.S. owned property. At the State Department this week, both sides expressed high hopes for the future, along with a long, difficult list of differences to be resolved. Mari Lee Cancio is a Miami attorney actively engaged in community affairs and the Republican Party, opposed to the Obama administration's opening toward Cuba. And this week, she attended an invitation-only White House briefing on the new U.S.-Cuba relationship. And also at that briefing, Freddie Balsera of Coral Gables, a Cuban-American Democrat, CEO of his own successful public affairs and media relations company. To both of you. Good morning. Good, Good morning. morning. Great, Hello. Great to have you come in. Well, we want to hear about the White House briefing, and Freddie, you were there as a Democrat, and uh, Mary Lee, I'm a little surprised you got invited. Good thing, but what did you think? I was very surprised to be invited. I thought it was a, a mistake. My invitation didn't get confirmed until the night before, um, but I was very happy to be there. Uh, I was part of... I attended a meeting at Miami Day College and perhaps that's why I received another invitation. Mm -hmm. I'm a trustee at Miami Day yeah. College when they all came and spoke a few months ago right. to another similar type of meeting. Uh, and at that meeting uh, I went and I spoke because a lot of the people that think like me uh, had refused attending that meeting including my aunt Sylvia Riondo who founded uh, Mothers Against Repression after the two uh, Brothers to the Rescue planes were shot down. Right. This we is know. a little symbol of Cuba right. that is part of um, her organization. And I went to that meeting and I almost cried because it was so emotional to me saying, why could you do this? And how could you do this without consulting with the people that have been fighting for freedom for so many decades here in Miami? So they heard me and perhaps they want to keep me informed as to what's happening. What, what were the headlines, Freddie, that you took from that meeting? There were so many public events last week, and this was a meeting really no one knew about until it was over. What's the headline from the briefing? Really, it was about uh, letting people know what's happened, and more importantly, what are the next steps? Uh, I'm glad Marily was there, uh, and we were joking off camera that if this was a Republican White House, I can almost assure you that Democrats like me would not be there, but I think that it shows you the theme of inclusiveness that exists around this effort. It also shows you that this is not a partisan issue. The fact of the matter is that there are many Republicans in Congress and there are many Republicans in this community that support a new policy of engagement. And that does not mean that, that the values and principles of the Cuban American community that supports uh, this new policy has changed. The yeah, objective but, is still the same. Yeah. I just think people are ready to try a new approach. All right, but Fred, you, you've got to concede that the Republicans in Congress who favor the rapprochement, the opening to Cuba, basically are all from farm states. They want to sell poultry, they want to sell rice, they want to sell all the goods and services. They currently can sell them, but they want to sell them on credit. That's what that I, I support is about. Uh, Jeff Flake, who was intimately involved Arizona. in this process, is from Arizona. Right. And uh, that's not uh, a, a traditional ag state. I think that these are people that above any other principle or idea want a new direction, want to create some kind of new dynamic. And a lot of that was discussed there. You know, one of, the, one of the areas that the White House encouraged all of us to be active in is engagement ourselves, not just relying on our State Department and our diplomats to begin mm -hmm. meeting well, Cubans well, how, and engaging How can Cubans. you be personally engaged? I, explain to us. What, Traveling what, there. What does that mean? Traveling there. 
and engaging Are folks. you going to travel there? I have traveled there, and I plan to travel again. And I've learned a lot by traveling there. Uh, I've learned, uh, I've been able to confirm some of the things that I grew up knowing. Uh, I've been able to see with my own eyes what the reality is in Cuba. And I've also been able to see what people there want today. And if we truly want to help them have a better life on so many different fronts, uh, uh, political, economic, human rights, then as the White House encourages us to do, we need to start going there and helping them do that directly by engaging. You know, travel is a major issue this week. There are two appropriations committees, one in Senate, one in House, that are literally battling over what to do about travel. The Senate appropriations bill wants to end the enforcement on the ban, which would effectively open travel. Uh, the House wants to shut it down even tighter, and Mary Lee, that is one of the bones of contention is travel to the island. But what's, what's interesting is that the travel ban is on Americans. It's not Cuba saying, no, you can't travel. It's the U.S. telling its own people, no, you can't travel. Well, the Cuban government doesn't let his people get out of the island unless the government allows them. Two main activists uh, didn't get their passports renewed. Uh, what happens in Cuba is the apartheid against its own people. Even the Cuban people can't, you know, with dollars go to a store, to a restaurant, or to a hotel. But isn't so, that a good argument for the anymore. U.S.? That, 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 excuse that, that, excuse that, me for one second. Isn't that a good argument for allowing the U.S. more uh, U.S. citizens more freedoms? Let let the Cuban government be the repressors and the censors. Anybody that wants to go to Cuba today can go to Cuba. I have never been to Cuba, and I'm not going to go to Cuba until Fidel Castro is dead. So and there's 12 direct flights from Miami to Havana, and anybody with any good excuse, even though the embargo is alive and well, can go to Cuba. You know, f first of all, thankfully, the policies have changed where Cubans can now stay in hotels, which is a ridiculous policy that was in place for, mm. for decades. But this argument but that you if say you go that, to but Cuba... Excuse me, but let, let me, me just say finish my point, and then okay. you can go on. The, the argument that if you go to Cuba, you're helping the Cuban government is false. And that's one of the pers uh, perspectives that you gain when you travel there. I've stayed in bed and breakfasts. So when I go there, that family that mm. took their home and converted two or three rooms into a bed and breakfast and serves you a meal mm -hmm. and gives you a place to lodge is making some kind of money and is less dependent on the Cuban government for their own survival did and well-being. You, did you book through Airbnb or how did you find these homes to You can to find them online. In. Some of these places, you know, these folks have some limited access to the, inter to the internet right. and they have websites for their homes. Or you could stay with, you know, through family members, you can find places. But they're abundant throughout Havana and by going, you start that process of helping these folks out. These people are now making some money. Now they have a somewhat normal life within what is a completely mm. abnormal society and they're becoming more independent from the Cuban government. And, and let me just tell you the experience of a lawyer that uh, works with me. She went to uh, Havana with her family because her father had never allowed her to go uh, when he was alive. He passed away and the mother who's in her 80s, while she still have, has health, wanted to take her children to see their old homes and where she grew up. And my friend, who's not political at all, came to me and said, you know, it was so emotional, it was so sad to see my family. And I agree. She was. She took the little taxi and the guy benefited. She said to me, my family said, whatever little soaps or shampoos you don't use in the hotel, yeah. can you please save it so that we'll use that? She says, they were so crappy. We saved all those little things to give to them. They came to the hotel, and this was last week, and they would not let her family go up to her own room. So this story that, oh, the Cuban people are free to go in and out of hotels is not correct. This is from someone that it's not political, that it's completely outside of this process. So that apartheid still exists and is alive and well. And then I think you bring up a good point by U.S. standards, at least. They would look at many Cubans living in what we would consider a, a poverty level. I want to, if we can, the foreign minister, Bruno Rodriguez, this week when he was at the State Department, we have a little clip of sound that I'm hoping we can cue up. And, and to your point, these, the White House and the State Department briefing that you all received is, is something that is almost unilateral from the U.S. point of view. And listen to what Foreign Minister Bruno Rodriguez said in the public press conference this week in Washington. I emphasize that the totally lifting of the blockade, the return of the legally occupied territory of Guantanamo, as well as the full respect for the Cuban sovereignty and the compensation to our people for human and economic damages are crucial to be able to move towards the normalization of relations. 
So how, yeah, how does the U.S., how do the U.S. and Cuba normalize relations when you have these kinds of demands on the table? Because Gitmo compensation for the damage from the embargo, lifting the embargo, taking Radio TV Marti off the air, with the exception of that, all these others are big, big items that will take a long time. Sure, this is a complicated process. And what we're seeing now is the first of many steps. And that's why I mentioned earlier, Glenna, that we talked about next steps in this briefing. For example, um, what are we going to do in terms of the, the claims? And it appears the State Department has a working group already addressing that. May, Those may issues I just have not gone away. Right, just to say, I, the last figure I saw, Marley, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, was $6 billion was the amount that the government of Cuba owes to the owners of properties that were confiscated in 1961. It's a tremendous issue. I mean, there's nothing normal about do normalizing relations with a communist government that is the longest standing regime in, in the Western Hemisphere. Nothing has changed. The Castros are still there. Uh, Johanny Sanchez in December, when Obama was going to make that announcement, said Castroism won. And today is July 26. Today is the 62nd anniversary of the July 26th movement that propelled Fidel Castro right. into power. The so in Cuba, thing. they're celebrating today, not only their July 26th movement, but the opening of their embassy in Washington, D.C., where they can put as many intelligent officers and spies as they want. And so can we now. And that's one of the big issues that we were able to achieve. Now our diplomats ha have unlimited access within Cuba, which never occurred before. Right. Well, and that allows our diplomats to now engage directly with people all over the island, which allows us to continue to, to foster a, yeah. American values that, and principles that was, there. That was a win in the negotiations between the two sides that says U.S. diplomats may travel all over the island. All I have to do is tell the Cuban government, we're going here, we're going there, but they don't have to ask With the exception of senior folks. Senior folks don't, do not have to do that. We're going to need to pick this up when we get back from this commercial. Stay tuned. Having the Cubans establish this uh, embassy uh, right in Washington, D.C., where they can do incredible amount of espionage against U.S. national security interests, I think is foolhardy and dangerously naive. Well, that was Congresswoman Ileana Ross Leighton on Monday, the day that the embassies opened. And, you know, honestly, she raises a good point. Uh, the, the Castro government, in my view, is a failure at many, many things, but espionage and repression of the people modeled in many ways on the East German uh, counterparts uh, of intelligence uh, is very good, and I, they will have spies, just as, in fact, the United States will have its CIA operatives in Havana. Uh, this week, uh, I went to a Spanish language show, and they showed a video of this kid that was in Panama protesting during the Summit of the Americas. Mm -hmm. And that same kid was at the opening of the embassy in Washington, D.C. So when in, they had been asking Panama about this kid, they said, well, that is just a citizen that saved all his money to come to Panama on his own. And <laughs> those are his own words. So in the Spanish language, they were making fun, saying he probably saved again to come to the opening, or he's part of the diplomatic contingency that went to the opening of the embassy. And that is the danger of having uh, our enemy right here. Nothing, nothing has changed with Cuba. The Cuban government once said, Cuba and Iran are going to bring the United States to its knees. I, can I just say, in fairness, that the United States and anyone else who ever is on television handpicks people to be the front person sure, as well. And, and you know, but, everything we're talking about here is not breaking news. And my response to what we're saying is, so what? And, you know, we're talking about stuff that we've known for 50 years. And instead of changing the paradigm, and even on shows like these, talking about the things that we now can do as Americans and the things that we think we can now move forward to advance our agenda as Americans, we, we're stuck talking about the same things from the mm. last 50 okay. years. Wait, why do we, we talk know about they have something spies. else? Why do we, we talk about the wages? Let's talk about wages. If you go to Cuba right now and you see in one of those hotels, the people that work in those hotels, they receive slave wages. They make 20 to $30 a month. And they make we more money if we could start going but and if Freddie, we could stay at bed and breakfast Freddie, and then we start uh, supporting correct. those people that have their own independent yes. business, which is something the new, which is crazy, is but it's new and, and, and it's something flourishing there policy. now. They're, they're, they're not going to do better 
their lives are not going to get better if we squeeze them the way Marco Rubio and other Republicans in Congress but intend you see, to do. This is this is not a political issue, and it's not Republican versus Democrat because even Debbie Wasserman Schultz agrees on my position on this Cuba issue. Cuba issue is not. A, Republicans versus Democrats, and it should not be. This is about human rights, human rights violations, and having an administration that negotiated normal, normalizing relations without dealing with the human rights issues. And since this policy was announced, the Cuban dissidents have suffered and will continue to suffer. And that was one of the points that Fair we learned ways. this week at the White House, is that these are very dangerous times for the dissidents. And yeah. when you talk about that at that briefing, what was the response from the White House and the State Department representatives on yeah. the U.S. reaction, or right. what will be the U.S. reaction to that? You may ask Freddie. Well, Freddie well, what, what was the response? Yeah. yeah. The response was that now that this process of opening embassies has taken place, the next round of conversations is specifically about human rights. That has never happened in the history of U.S.-Cuba relations. And the fact that we now have relations, we now can engage, means that we can sit across a table and start talking about human rights abuses in Cuba. The Obama administration is not blind to this. By no means. It is something that is on the table. And now, for the first time ever, we can actually speak openly with the Cuban government and make our demands open and listen to what they have to say to see if we can make progress in this area. But here, here's the question. What kind of demands can the U.S. make when the U.S. is unilaterally giving all of these opening concessions to Cuba? It's not unilateral. It's not unilateral. It's, it is the beginning of a relationship. Because, you know, we talked about spies and embassies and, and things like that. You know, China hacks into our federal government constantly. They just recently hacked into our Office of Personal Management, and they have one of the biggest, if not the biggest, embassy here in the United States. So one approach is to completely be standoffish, to not have any kind of engagement, which does not work. And another approach, which is what we're advancing, is that you can make progress by talking engagement. and engaging. Yeah. That my doesn't point, mean you agree with everything. My point is that we need to engage with the Cuban dissidents, the people that were left out of the conversation. We people do engage like with Berta, the Cuban dissidents. No, you did not. Berta, one, of, Berta one, of points, one of the points Berta was brought Soler. up the other day is, is that for the first time ever, Cuban dissidents went to the home of the American ambassador in Washington, and now there were Cuban uh, government officials there, and there were ambassadors from other countries that historically have never gone to the Cuban ambassador's home. So these dissidents now had exposure to ambassadors from an array of countries that before they could not speak to, and directly with Cuban government officials. Yeah. That is progress, folks. Well, as a matter of fact, uh, former, uh, the head of the U.S. Centrist section, James Kaysen, now the mayor of Coral Gables, uh, said to me a number of weeks ago, it will be a really indicative of how this is working. On July 4th, we spoke about July 1st, if the U.S. interest section invites both Cuban officials and dissidents to the annual 4th of July party, and they did. And so I guess uh, there were conversations that may have taken place between uh, maybe the ladies in white and somebody from the Cuban government. I'm not a Pollyanna. I'm not saying this is the millennium, but, I mean, it's better to be talking than not, isn't it? Part of the conversation at the White House is saying, try to engage with the dissidents that don't agree with our uh, policy, our current policy, because don't take my word for it. Take the word of the people inside of Cuba that are fighting for freedom. We gave every every demand to the Cuban government and we traded the spies we traded the people that were guilty of you know killing four Americans in those two airplanes that were shut down right. they are the people that nobody was prosecuted for that this month was the 21st anniversary of the sinking of that boat that killed over 30 people including 10 children um, nobody, de de nobody 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 was punished for that. So we're dealing with the same people. They haven't changed. The only thing that changed is that they no longer have their sugar daddy of Russia supporting them or Venezuela oil money supporting them. So now they need our money. And they get the money anyway, but what they want is credit. Is there any thought behind the fact that embassies and consulates are there to help the people, not the government? Absolutely. The people. That, 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 that's one of the driving principles. In fact, uh, I, I want to point something out that, that is inconsistent with what you said. Because when our diplomats were there negotiating, David Duckenfield, who's an assistant secretary of state from Miami, uh, went and met with almost all the dissidents while he was there. And this is in the midst of negotiations. Something like that in previous years could have derailed entirely the conversations. Yeah. Yeah. So to, to, to give this impression 
that the Obama administration just gave away the store and was not strong and did not talk about human rights is completely All false. Right. So that's going to be that's going to be unfortunately because this is a great debate. The final word for this segment, Freddie Balsera, thanks very Thank much, you. and Marilee Cuncio, always good to see you. And still to come, some analysis and opinion on this and the week's top stories. We are talking with the roundtable, and that's next. It is time for some fun. No, nope. yes. <laughs> it's time to dig down into the week's top news stories, looking behind the headlines. And that, of course, means it is time for our powerhouse roundtable, and we've got a good one today. Juan Vasquez, deputy editor of the Miami Herald editorial page, a South Florida news veteran. We are glad to welcome him back. Henry Crespo is president of the Democratic Mike Caucus of Florida, commentator on all kinds of media platforms on culture and politics in South Florida. Patricia Vila is a veteran reporter who opened the CNN Bureau in Havana and lived there and worked there for four years. She just returned, as a matter of fact, from a week-long trip to Cuba where she met with the head of the U.S. interest section, now embassy, Jeffrey De Laurentiis, and also met with some top government officials there. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So Good morning. Nice Great to have, to have you come in. Yeah. Uh, Juan, could I begin by just simply asking you, we in the media are often accused and indeed often guilty of overblowing stories. Really? <laughs> shocked. <laughs> You're shocked. shocked to hear it. But I mean, my question is uh, about the opening of the embassies, restoring diplomatic relations. Uh, we have told our audiences, uh, print and broadcast, this is really a big deal. It, it I think a, it is a big deal because it is a change in paradigm. That's what the administration uh, uh, is saying about the policy, and this is symbolic of that. Right. I think it's going to be an even bigger deal when John Kerry goes to Havana. In two that and a half weeks? It's going to feel a lot more dramatic. Yeah. Patty, you've been there this week. You know, it, it's a big deal here. It's a very big deal here to people on the island. Being there, is there a change there for them? They are very optimistic, Glenna. Yeah. They are very optimistic. They're being very positive. Um, I walked the streets of Havana, Centro Havana, Havana Vieja, Vedado. I mean, I did it all and, and just stood on a street corner one afternoon talking to, uh, for two hours to people passing by. Everybody's very uh, positive, but the question is, how is this going to affect me? Like Freddie mentioned, I stayed with a Cuban family and I paid $25 a night to, to rent a room at a, at a better breakfast and the family was just absolutely lovely. And we spoke every day, I spoke to neighbors and you know, the, the big question is, how is this gonna affect me? And I stayed with them because I wanted to help them financially. I didn't right. want to stay in a and hotel. And did you, did you eat at the Palais ours, the family-owned restaurants that are not run by Al Import or any of the Cuban military subsidiaries? I did. Almost every night I ate at a Paladar. I've been traveling to Cuba since 1994. I mean, the first story I covered was the rafter crisis. That's the first time that I that I went to Cuba. And before going to Cuba, I was a supporter of the embargo. And I when I went there and I saw what was truly happening and spent two weeks with Bernard Shaw and John Zarella, I said, wow, this is wrong. And that at that time, CNN was trying to open up an office right. there. And everybody thinks it was Ted Turner because of his relationship with Fidel Castro. And that's not true. It was a vice president named Larry Register that was traveling there to open up that office. And I joined in the last two and a half years. So this is a topic, that, topic that's been very close to my heart for over 20 years. Right. Henry Crespo, yes. you, uh, first time on the round table. Love having you here. Well, thank, thank you for you. having me. Your, your family great. background? I, I was telling it's... Michael and you guys that I've, we've made it. <laughs> <laughs> your, your well, family we, background? We've made it to him. You all right? So, what thank is your take you. on this? You have a Cuban family background. You well, hear this? What well, my mother take? and father both Cuban. My mother came in the late early '60s. My father came in the late uh, '50s as a merchant marine. I think you know this is an opportunity to change the discussion. Um, you have over probably 1.5 million people that have visited Cuba within the last five years. Business from the United States of America, and I think the most interesting point is that when the investment starts coming in Cuba, you have people that are not making a living, five dollars a month, ten dollars a month. They're on rations and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So when this investment starts flowing, you're going to see a new thinking, a new energy. Uh, in the Cuban people that want to be part of success and opportunity without them without dependency on the Cuban government so this is going to incite something well one of the changes in the last couple of years that uh, uh, that Castro Raul Castro has made one is issuing licenses allowing private businesses I mean they're not huge things I mean you can you're gonna need a license to do shoe shines down at the plaza 
or other small businesses. Uh, and yet it, it is apparently changing the sense of entrepreneurship uh, is sort of possible in Cuba. They, th these are changes at the edge, right? They're, they're changes in degree, not changes in kind. But that old saying, you know, been down so long, it looks like up to me. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of Cubans feel that way. Yeah. I guess the question now is, do economic changes translate into socio-political changes? I think they will, Glenn. I think at the end they will. I mean, this is a conversation that we're starting, and we need to be <clears> friends. I mean, there's so many things that go on behind the scenes. I mean, I can sit here for hours and tell you so many stories that I was involved in where we had to bring the U.S. government and the Cuban government together. I mean, one even occurred uh, during the year that I lived there of bringing a helicopter from a local Miami Hospital to the outskirts of Havana to pick up a, an American who was injured. I mean, CNN acted like the, the, the U.S. Embassy while we were there. I mean, we had Americans that would go there and always come into the office saying, I ran out of money. How do I get money uh, to myself? And we would send them to the U.S. Mm. interest section in order for them to get cash mm. to get back home. Mm. So this is why I support this. this. The Cuban people want, this is something the Cuban people want. And, you know, over in Cuba, I met with government officials and I can tell you, many of them support the relationships, but others don't. Just like we're going, just like what is happening here in the community and in Washington D.C. Well, and actually, the polls show that the majority of Americans now want it too. And the majority of Cuban Americans, in fact, support some kind of engagement rather than isolation, which we've had for 54 years. Uh, Patty, you know the point that uh, uh, Mari Lee Cancio made about uh, pro-democracy, the activists on the island. The crackdown since December 17th, when President Obama announced we're going to have this, try to have this new relationship, the crackdown on the ladies in white and Atunas and, and Dr. Bissett, all these brave men and women who are not advocating the downfall of the Castro government, they simply want democratic uh, rights, uh, human rights. Uh, how do you reconcile all this? Uh, going on. And I want human rights for them too, but I believe that we can achieve human rights by dialogue and communication. One of my sources in Washington DC said, Patty, you know why we're pushing so hard and we want the embargo lifted and we want to have relations is because if we have relationships, a relationship with Cuba, we can discuss human rights issue and we can bring all these issues that, of concern to the table. And yeah. having the relationship we have, you know, before we weren't able to do that. Right. Uh, you know, Henry, uh, uh, we have learned uh, uh, from people like uh, uh, professors at the uh, Institute for Cuban and Cuban American Studies at the University of Miami, 60% of Cuba now is Afro-Cuban. They are black people. Right. And they, unlike the <coughs> white Cubans, mm -hmm. don't really have many family members. They don't get remittances. And they have suffered as a whole more than anybody else. Do you think that they now have a better chance to, you know, increase their, the way they live, uh, their uh, economics? Listen, I think that an investment in Cuba, over a billion dollars, now comes through Cuba, through the black market as it relates to entrepreneurship opportunities. So there's a lot of entrepreneurship in Cuba. But to your point, 40% of black, maybe my complexion, another 30% of mulatto, and everything else is different. Um, I think overall for the Cuban people, it's going to be an opportunity for all sectors. If you're poor, if you're black, if you're mulatto, if you're white, there's going to be an opportunity to do business because there's going to be so much money coming through. And let me tell you something, there are a lot of Cuban folks that are of color that are educated, mm -hmm. but don't have the opportunities. They're doctors, they're engineers, they're lawyers and all this. So yes, will, that, will, the, will the folks that are at the bottom of the rug uh, that are mostly of color, unfortunately, not just in Cuba but around the world, will get an opportunity? Absolutely. But there's also going to be other opportunities for everybody that will be able to pull up those that are yeah. living in poverty. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that, and I don't mean to interrupt, but one of the, what Cuban government would say, one of the <clears throat> triumphs of the revolution is that everyone gets educated. Absolutely. That's a good thing. It's just that they don't have no access to... What do you do with that? Too? Exactly. I was just going to say, one of the things that struck me watching the debate earlier, and this happens all the time, there is no dispute between Republicans and Democrats about the nature of the Castro government. Right. Mary Lee said that, and Freddie Balsera, I noticed, spoke about human rights abuses as a taken for granted. Right. This is true. The issue is, what is the best policy? 
and one person is speaking about policy, the other person is speaking about the nature of the government, and when you get that, you get a muddled discussion. Yeah, I, th I think that one of the caveats that I certainly have to what is going on is that Raul Castro and Patty, I mean, you lived, you lurked, worked there, is that his model appears to be uh, for an economy, political, geo system, geoeconomic system, is both Vietnam and China, where you have free market capitalism to an extent, but you have a closed political system dominated by one authoritarian party. I've been reading that and I've been uh, seeing that as well, but I'm hoping that the Cubans will find their way and that they will become a free market system is what I would like to see for the Cuban people as well as for people that are working in the Cuban government because believe me, a lot of younger generation Q people that work in the Cuban government want to see free trade and a country like the United States of America. All right, we have a lot more to talk about with the round table, so sit tight, we will be right back. Welcome back. Before we continue with the roundtable, we feel compelled to send warm condolences to the family of Robert Parker. He is the former Miami-Dade police director who passed away this week. This was him being sworn in, and he was with that department for 33 years, rose to the top as its first African-American chief. He died suddenly at his home this week, and uh, the, the community outpouring has just been outstanding for his family and we would like to add our condolences and love to the Parker family for his death. Yeah, well said. I knew Bobby Parker. I, I liked him so much and he was a terrific police director respected by... A principled and ethical yes, man. Yes, he was. Yes. He, we will miss him. Not in the headlines a lot and that's a good thing. Yes. You're, yes. Perhaps, you're good right point. one. All right, let's move on if we can to presidential politics because this week there was a Mason, a Mason Dixon poll that came out with I thought kind of surprising results. Maybe we can put the results up on the air so that you and home can uh, see this. Here it is. This, this is the standing of the GOP candidates in Florida. Uh, Jeb Bush, 28 percent. Marco Rubio, 16 percent. Scott Walker, 13. Donald Trump, fourth in Florida with 11 percent. And I believe, even if we don't have the graphic, Hillary Clinton had 58 percent. It's not even close. She is you know, so wildly popular. Uh, Henry, uh, I mean, you run the Democratic Florida Caucus, Florida. the Florida Black Democratic uh, Caucus. Nice. What do you make of these numbers? With the Republicans? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've never it's, seen Henry Crespo speechless before, ever. <laughs> well, I guess my question, my question really is, why, <clears throat> if Donald Trump is just going crazy, in Iowa, New Hampshire, across the country. Right. Why is he fourth in Florida? Well, Florida is a different dynamic. I mean, look, Barack, the president, won um, uh, in his election, which uh, you have about three or four different states within a state. Um, so it's, it's complex in Florida. And Trump type of politics doesn't work in the state of Florida. I mean, we have Hispanics, we got blacks, we got... And we uh, have two homegrown favorites as oh, well. And, and let me tell you something, uh, Jeb Bush uh, and Marco is going to be real interesting. The, the only thing about Marco, I would say that, you know, he, he has the ability to really be a transformational president or transformational candidate in a sense because his youth, senator, Florida, it's mixed. So once he gets out of this real conservative thing, it'll be real interesting how his politics change. And Jeb Bush, we don't have to talk about him as his governorship. One, right. I think, was it the Miami Herald or another news outlet who said that Donald Trump is about the best thing that's ever happened to the Jeb Bush candidacy? <laughs> that's right. That was this morning. Front, and front they, they, were making, uh, they were making the point that the crazier he is, uh, the more that Jeb Bush especially looks like the adult in the conversation. Right. Uh, Juan, if I could, before we came on the air, we were having a cup of coffee in the green room, and you described, I did not know, that you, you were, your hometown uh, is Laredo, Texas, and we That's all know right. Donald Trump flew down there in his 757 or whatever that big uh, jet <laughs> is uh, with Trump on the side and uh, made a big deal of going to the border and <clears throat> you explained to the people in Laredo it's no big deal. 
for most people, this is just not an issue because immigration has always been there. There's always been some degree of illegal immigration, and they understand that. But I think he missed the boat because the issue they care about a lot are the illegal drugs coming in from Mexico mm -hmm. and how it has turned Nuevo Laredo, Mexico, which is the sister city, just on the other side of the Rio Grande into a no-go zone. Hmm. I would, when I've been down there lately, I say, well, let's go to Nuevo Laredo to have lunch or dinner. And they say, are you crazy? Nobody goes there anymore. And Trump did not uh, mention that, exactly. uh, of, of course. He would have gotten a more attentive audience had he uh, yeah. talked about that. Uh, uh, Petty, I mean, from your point of view, when you look at uh, these candidates and you see especially Trump uh, uh, with his immense ego and this brashness, but what it seems to be appealing to so many Republicans and Tea Partiers is he just doesn't hold back. People are tired of... <clears throat> of, of reticent politicians, and I think that's part of his appeal. That's true. That's very true. And I, and Henry and I have done other shows, and I've said that uh, Hillary Clinton should be a little bit more transparent. I think she, she would wear little dresses. She's always in pants. You know, people look at that. People look at, at your image and the way that you are. And one thing I want to say about Donald Trump is that I find his comments very insulting as a woman, as a Latina. I don't like <clears throat> it. Um, and I just, honestly, I agree with you, that it's just going to come down to Jeb Bush and uh, Hillary Clinton. That's where I see things going. Yet the more he sucks up all the oxygen in the room, the more he gets the numbers, and the more he may be one of those people on the debate stage and well, crowding out someone about else. Numbers, keep two numbers in mind, 30,000 and 50,000. If you can get 30,000 votes in Iowa, 50,000 in New Hampshire, then you're in. You're doing very well. I'm not sure he can do it. Yeah. We should point out, uh, before we run out of time, that on Friday, Jeb Bush and Hillary Clinton and a few other Republican candidates are going to be on the same stage at the National Urban, Urban League Convention in Fort Lauderdale. We will be there. I just can't wait to see them sitting at least in proximity to each other. Uh, it will be very courteous, but uh, there are going to be sharp differences. We got to go. We do. This has been great, and we're so happy to have you all in for the roundtable, and you are all invited back very soon. <laughs> Thank you. Look Thank forward you. to it. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Up next, a big step forward in the quest for a soccer stadium. The Miami City, City Commission took a critical vote this week, and the Orange Bowl site has their approval. On Tuesday, soccer superstar David Beckham is scheduled to be in Denver for a meeting of Major League Soccer's Board of Governors. David Beckham and his partners are going to show them a resolution they got from the Miami Commission this week that puts the city of Miami on record as fully supporting a stadium at the old Orange Bowl site. I don't know anybody's district that doesn't want Major League Soccer in Miami. Miami commissioners want Major League Soccer in their city. And for Miami Beckham United to play in a stadium that could look something like this, shoehorned onto property next to Marlins Park. Have you seen a rendering of a stadium that would go on the former Orange Bowl site? And does it fit? Yes, it, it does fit. Uh, I have seen a concept. Uh, it does fit. The soccer stadium would be built on empty land, mostly owned by the city, which would then lease it to Beckham's group. But they'd also need adjacent property, now occupied by a daycare, a couple of businesses, and some modest apartment buildings. The situation is where are we going to move? Because the rent here is kind of good price and move to another place it would be very difficult. Today we walk the neighborhood. The 80 year old owner of this home told me he's very worried and doesn't want to move. I find it irresponsible and disrespectful to the residents the way this information came out. The mayor and city manager today promised to help relocate anyone displaced by the stadium. In return, the mayor asked for commissioners to pass an important resolution. The only thing it does is that it's asking you to direct the city manager to start uh, negotiation or conversation uh, with uh, Beckham and other necessary parties for development of a new Major League Soccer Stadium facility at the site adjacent to the Marlins Park in the city of Miami.
After that meeting, the mayor met with a member of the University of Miami Board of Trustees, and he says several trustees, including the chair, are still interested in the possibility of the Canes playing football at an expanded soccer stadium site. Still to come, my personal perspective about a political fundraising campaign on Miami Beach that doesn't pass the smell test. All right, here is a live look from our Miami Tower cam. It looks like, well, it rained earlier, but it uh, looks okay now. Kind of pretty, and here is Weather Authority meteorologist Jennifer Correo with our Sunday forecast. Good afternoon, Glenna and Michael. Yes, it did rain earlier, but there's still plenty of rain to speak of. Take a look at this radar. It is a busy afternoon, and most of the rain, even though, is to the west. We are seeing a couple of strong showers and thunderstorms now. Right now, entering southwest Miami-Dade, Homestead, Redland, and eventually Kendall getting some heavy down. And the, ne the next few minutes. Also, rain uh, stretching down over Biscayne Bay now is heading into Key Biscayne. And then the Keys also dealing, take a look at this, with some heavy downpours just to the north and west. That is headed your way. It will eventually be very heavy rainfall for the rest of today. I'm just going to jump over into the seven day because we do stay unsettled, at least for the start of the work week. A little more sunshine tries to return on Tuesday. Michael? Uh, Jennifer, thanks. All right, before we leave you this morning, a personal perspective about a political fundraising campaign that's underway on Miami Beach, and it doesn't pass the smell test. The money, about a million bucks so far, is pouring into a political action committee called Relentless for Progress, RFP. Some of that money is paying for this TV ad featuring Miami Beach Mayor Philip Levine, who is seen bragging about all the good things he and his commission buddies are doing. And in fact, there are many good things going on on Miami Beach, thanks to Mayor Levine. He's a smart guy, successful businessman, a leader in the campaign to raise awareness about sea level rise and climate change. And he was a champion for installing those huge pumps on South Beach to alleviate tidal flooding. Good for him. The mayor, I think, was also right to stop bars on Ocean Drive from serving drinks outside after 2 a.m. so that the street didn't become another bourbon street. But the mayor and his good friend Jonah Wolfson, a Miami Beach commissioner who is term limited, are now engaged in a fundraising campaign that just stinks. Their political action committee is strong arming city vendors for big contributions. Now, the city attorney says it's okay legally, and perhaps it is, but it is not okay morally or ethically. And when two Miami Beach commissioners asked to send the question of the Miami Dade Ethics Commission, they were voted down. Unbelievable. Demanding money from city vendors just is not right. And we're talking about donations that range from $20,000 to $100,000. The County Ethics Commission says it is going to investigate on its own, as well it should, but that will take months. Next fall's elections will be long over by the time the Ethics Commission finally weighs in. And in the meantime, all that PAC money will be used to elect Miami Beach Commission candidates who are supporters of Mayor Levine. Nothing wrong with that, nothing wrong with running a slate of candidates. What is wrong is taking money from people who do business with the city of Miami Beach, who are limited in the amount of money they can give individual candidates, but are not limited in how much they can give to a PAC. The PAC then helps their favorite candidates. It's all very clever and all very stinky. Mayor Levine has a bright political future. His political action committee is dimming his luster. That's my perspective. Hope you have a wonderful Sunday. Remember, as always, stay informed, get involved. And we love to hear what you think about any topic in the news. We invite you to weigh in at any of these addresses right here, email, Facebook, Twitter, anything else you can find. We're there with you. Love being with you. Have a great Sunday afternoon. Bye.